welcome our colleague Cornelia Ernst, co-chairing uh, this meeting in her capacity as chair of the Iran delegation. Uh, many thanks also to Hannah Neumann, uh, who was an inspiration for the activities uh, of this week. Uh, indeed, uh, you will have seen already that the European Parliament, that our institutions, our subcommittee, our delegation, um, AFET and other institutions have foreseen solidarity days with Iranian people in this week and that for good reason. We will have several events um, today, tomorrow and on Thursday. The objective is to explore with a large spectrum of representatives of Iranian civil society ways of supporting human rights, women and civil society in Iran and to reflect on the prospects of Iran's democratic movement and on how the EU should respond to the challenges Iran faces in these days. Since September 22 and the tragic death of young Iranian woman Masha Amini, Iranian peaceful protesters were faced with massive repression by the Iranian authorities. The European Parliament and our subcommittee especially have followed closely the developments in the country with hope and with concern. The European Parliament adopted several resolutions. Allow me to recall them briefly. October 22, European Parliament condemned the systematic violent arrests, abuses and ill treatment of women, as well as the widespread intentional um, use of force by Iranian security forces against peaceful protesters. January 23, we condemned the executions of young protesters and the killings of several hundreds of peaceful protesters. And in this resolution also we called on the High Representative and the Council to expand the necessarily to expand the EU sanction list to all individuals and entities responsible for human rights violations. And last March, finally, we condemned the poisoning of thousands of schoolgirls and called on the Commission and the Member States to increase technical and capacity support to Iranian civil society. We urged member states to facilitate the issuance of visas and asylum and emergency grants to those who need to leave Iran, particularly women and girls. Today, in the presence of our distinguished guests, we wish to go a step further. We would like to have an assessment of the situation um, in Iran and uh, in particular in the areas our guests are working on and we would discuss concrete recommendations, what we can consider, what we, the European Parliament, what we, the European Union, and our member states can do to concretely, constructively, and efficiently help to shape and to build a better future for Iranians. This is our purpose uh, today, I could finally inform you that we will continue to actively address the situation in Iran, including uh, this week in Geneva, where we will, as a subcommittee, conduct a visit and meet with the members of the Independent International Fact-Finding Mission, decided in November 22 by the UN Human Rights Council, by the Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in Iran, and additionally key stakeholders. We will share the outcome of today's debate with all of them and explore new avenues to reflect and to cooperate. I now give the floor to Cornelia Ernst, uh, the chair of the delegation for relations with Iran. Thanks a lot. I will speak in my home language, wonderful German language. Zunächst um, <laughs> viel. First of all, thank you very much to our guests, 
It's a great pleasure to have you with us here today. I'd also like to thank Udo Bullmann, uh, who is uh, leading the Human Rights Committee uh, for the excellent cooperation that we have. It's very important that we speak with one voice as a parliament, that we remain consistent and coherent, and that we all pull in the same direction. Uh, AFET uh, and Human Rights Committees are working very closely together, and it's not doesn't always go without saying that we get such good uh, cooperation. Since the violent death of uh, Ms. Amini, we've been uh, looking at the question of democracy and human rights in Iran. There have been many times, uh, many resolutions, as we've just heard. Uh, and we uh, worked have been working on this, in fact, since 2011, uh, when there were big uh, demonstrations there. In uh, 2012, we, uh, there were, the Sakharov Prize was uh, given to uh, two uh, activists uh, from uh, Iran, and uh, I had met both of them in Tehran uh, after they were awarded the prize, which was a very moving moment for me. Nasrin Tasudeh, uh, is doing enormously uh, important work to support women and women's rights. And uh, she's paying a very high price for that, as we all know. Uh, uh, and that goes for many activists in Iran who are still there, still active, and they are paying a high price for their activities. And we need to be stand uh, firm by their sides, the protests of the uh, last few months are not the first ones in the Islamic Republic, but in terms of their quality, uh, there, there is a different mood. And the uh, uh, um, gap between the activists and the people and the state uh, has become bigger and uh, bigger. This conflict how we can overcome this conflict is something that we uh, need to uh, reflect on. We've been through similar cases in uh, Europe. I come from a country where we had a peaceful resolution, a long and successful uh, revolution. And it's important because if every historical situation is unique, but we need to draw lessons from each one and we need to aim at being peaceful, inclusive and democratic in our approach. We in the European Parliament want to support civil society, and that is something that we've been doing for many, many years now, and I think there are a few parliaments that are as present uh, with uh, civil, side by side with civil society. And those in the Iranian diaspora know that we all want change in that country. The sanctions in the USA aren't making things, uh, making it easy to help financially. We are trying to help civil society uh, in Iran, uh, nevertheless. And in Europe, should not uh, push back people who come to Europe from Iran uh, asking for uh, refugee uh, protection. And we really must not uh, let any aspect of, drop any aspect uh, of all of this uh, situation. We need to focus on every, uh, everything, every point. And so this discussion is all the more important. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cornelio. I'll give the floor to Madi Golro, journalist and women's rights activist uh, for some seven minutes, please. Hello, everybody. Thank you for inviting me and my friend to talking about my country, uh, my lovely country under the dictatorship government and about the modern revolution in Middle East, women, life, freedom. Women, life, freedom revolution can change not just the Iran, can change many things in Middle East and in the world about the Islam, about the dictatorship, about the how women can make a decision about everything from their dress, their uh, clothes, until their country, change their country. Uh, this revolution started just less than one month after Islamic revolution. 
you know, the first group of people who make a demonstration against the Islamic regime was women. On the 8th of March, just three weeks after overcome the Islamic regime in Iran. So I think we now can believe that the women in Iran start to change Mullah regime and Islamic regime. And thank you for this opportunity to talk about uh, this revolution. I will briefly mention some important issue. The most important thing is the internet in my country. All kinds of social media in Iran is filtered. Uh, Telegram, Instagram, uh, WhatsApp, Netflix, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and all kinds of social, social media can you imagine. So it's, uh, uh, the government tried to make a wall between Iran and out of Iran. And I think one of the things that the European country and Western country can help to activists inside Iran to make their voice is try to help to free the Internet. Access to the international Internet is essential for Iran. Over the past 10 years, Iranian government has developed its own computer networks known as a national information network as an alternative to Internet. Every time that the Iranian government shut down the internet, the local network is working. If we want to break this network, we need to provide access to the international internet, such as cloud providers. The United States government issued general license D2 to relax tech sanction. However, we are not seeing any of these big technology co uh, companies actually implement it. It's not only access, it's also about security. People in Iran need to store their data outside of Iran to protect their data from unlawful access of Iranian security service. EU also needs to keep accountable those who violate the right of Iranian people to access to the Internet. Targeted individual sanction can help. For example, uh, in uh, bloody November, uh, the government shut down internet for uh, five days and uh, killed more than 1,000 people in the street. It's between 1,000 or 1,500. And after more than two weeks, we as a journalist can understand how was happening in our country. And now every time that the internet is weaker and weaker in Iran, the first thing that comes in our mind is what's happening. They start to kill others. They start to arrest our friends and journalists and feminists. That's why I think inside the everything else that the Western country can help, the most important thing is the technology and the Internet. So we need to break the isolation but relaxing tech sanction and at the same time going after those who are responsible for uh, violence uh, of human rights. I, uh, I highly request that you... Uh, ask the, uh, the Iran government to let you visit the Iran prisons, especially Iran prison. I could not bear the prison, so I was forced to flee the country. But I'm really, to, uh, I'm really ready to accompany the visiting team to visit the prison in the future. If the Islamic Republic access nuclear weapons, it will threaten the world. Today, Iranian people fight for world peace. Supporting the current revolution in Iran is not just make benefit the Iranian people, but it could secure benefit all over the world. The Iran government supports all Islamic extremist groups in the world. Their weapons and budget come from the Iran's oil money. Middle East without an Islamic republic could be calmer and more peaceful. From the uh, from the uh, Syrian war, Yemen and Sudan and providing weapons for Ukraine's war to uh, assaulting Salman Rushdie to become of Islamic regime in Iran. 
Negotiation with, the, with a government that kills its own people is insulting to most Iranian people who do not want this government. Western countries are considering about making another Syria or Libya, but it's because they don't know this modern revolution where more than 90 of Iranian, 90 percent of Iranian people are educated, the highest education, education rates in Middle East. Iranian people want freedom and democracy, which is why they are against Islamic dictatorship. Iranians have the most asylum seekers among, among the asylums who try to cross Manj Canal. The continuation of the current Islamic regime could even increase the rate of asylum seekers. So, I just I ask you uh, listen to the independent uh, journalists and activists and try to help to the people in Iran just as they want not something that you can think it's good for yourself or your country. What is good for freedom, human rights, and women's rights in Iran? Thank you. Madigoro, many, many thanks for your analytical approach, but also for the very, very precise recommendations of what is to be done. This is exactly what we would like to see today and what we like to um, discuss amongst us to go further in, in progress uh, and in giving support. Hamed Esmailion um, is with us. Um, I had the pleasure to meet him in a huge manifestation in Frankfurt uh, where he contributed to. Um, he is a writer and activist and I have uh, to say that uh, we are deeply sorry for the loss that he has um, to pay to the crimes of the regime uh, because uh, members of his family fall, uh, fell victim to this criminal activities. Uh, we welcome you uh, here and we are very happy to have you today with us, Hamid. Thank you very much, Mr. Bowman. Uh, distinguished members, thank you for inviting me to appear before you. My name is Hamid Ismailion. I lost my wife and nine-year-old daughter when the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps shot down Ukrainian flight PS752 over the skies of Tehran on January 8, 2020. I have been active with the Association of Families of Flight PS752 victims in their fight for justice, truth, and accountability. That heinous crime claimed the lives of 177 innocent passengers and crew members aboard, aboard that flight including 55 Canadians and many European passengers from Ukraine, Sweden, and United Kingdom. The willful murder of Flight PS752 passengers is yet another link in the endless chain of crimes per perpetrated by the Islamic Republic regime over the last 44 years. I join you today to speak of the continuing upheaval that has engulfed Iran since the murder of Mahsa Jina Amini <clears throat> seven months ago. It is indeed a great honor to be in Europe where so many of you have stood with the people of Iran in their quest for justice, human rights and liberty. Many European elected officials have stepped up to sponsor persecuted Iranian dissidents. I would also like to thank many of your member states for ensuring that the Human Rights Council in Geneva created a fact-finding mission on human rights violations in Iran and for supporting the initiative to expel the Islamic Republic from the UN Committee on the Status of Women in New York. We know all too well that under these dire circumstances, time and advocacy is essential. United in diversity is the motto that underlines the essence of the European Union that is strive strives to forge a common destiny rooted in shared values and a humanist heritage. Unity in diversity inspires the woman life freedom revolution in Iran that is led by brave women and youth. Europe's rude awakening in the aftermath of Putin's aggression teaches us that authoritarian states do not respect these fundamental values and cannot be trusted. And I certainly hope that you will know now ensure 
that your policies regarding the Islamic Republic of Iran demonstrate the same strong commitment to your core principles and values. The dire situation in Iran continues. Iranian women continue their decades-long resistance against repression, forced hijab, and an apartheid system that suppresses them in all aspects of their lives. Blue-collar blue workers around the country suffer under a corrupt system that leaves them with little to no means of sustenance. The sporadic strikes are evolving into a nationwide workers' uprising. White-collar workers suffer under similar circumstances and must soon join the revolution with institutional strikes. Young men and women have no means to communication with the outside world as a state-controlled system censors, monitors, and limits access to the Internet. Tragically, young schoolgirls are systematically targeted in their schools with widespread poison attacks. These are merely the highlights of the conditions in Iran. Several hundred deaths, many summary executions after rapid show trials, prominent political dissonance and social activists are in prisons around the country, and many more thousand ordinary peaceful protesters have been incarcerated with no access to proper legal representation. Rampant inflation and exponential devaluation of currency has left the general population in acute, in acute despair. All the while, the military kleptocracy and regime operatives enjoy lavish lives and use their privileged position to loot the country's coffers. Iranians are demanding nothing less than an end to the unaccountable criminal tyranny in Tehran. Any attempts, uh, so, and with polls suggesting more than 80% of the population wants an end to the regime. As such, any attempt to appease the regime will prove a folly of historic proportions. It is time for Europe to awaken to the fact that the Islamic Republic is not just a menace to its own people, but that is equally beholden to undermining global security and even the welfare of you EU citizens. As you are aware, the Iranian regime has assassinated many of its opponents in Europe. Belgium recently convicted an operative of the regime that sought to denote a bomb at a crowded event. British officials recently dismantled as many as, as 10 such attempts on their soil. Germany uncovered an individual allegedly directed by the IRGC to plan a chemical attack in the country. The Islamic regime has wrongfully convicted and is shame uh, and incarcerated four innocent Swedes, two French, one German, and, and, and one Austrian national in shameless hostage diplomacy. Any attempt by the EU, EU to undertake renewed negotiations with the Islamic Republic will simply be construed as a sign of weakness and further embolden the regime to continue on the same audacious path. I'm here to put your ears to the hearts of brave young Iranian men and women and compel you to take action. Use your voice to force the Islamic regime to stop the bloodshed on the streets. Free all political prisoners immediately and without conditions or the humiliation of bail or suspended sentences. Demand that the Islamic regime halt all executions immediately. Expel the Islamic Republic from international workers' unions, the IKO and other international organizations. Help us to coordinate with international workers' unions to set up a strike fund for Iranian workers. Use the technology and means at your disposal to provide free and unhindered access to the Internet for the people of Iran. And finally, call the IRGC what it is, an officially named and nefarious, bloodthirsty and corrupt entity as a terrorist organization. Put your words into action and prove your solidarity with the people of Iran by dismissing Iranian diplomats from your countries and listing the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps personnel as persona non grata in the EU. I thank you for the time you provided me for my opening remarks, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Ahmed. Our next speaker is Fatemi Karimi, researcher in sociology of gender, women's rights activist, and president of Kurdistan Human Rights Network in France. Please, you have the floor for seven minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, 
I am here today as a representative of the Kurdistan Human Rights Network, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak. Most of the Iranian people is oppressed by the central authorities, the, and initially by the Pahlavi dynasty and now by the Islamic Republic. But the level of oppression is not the same, depending on sexual, sexual orientation, uh, religious beliefs and so forth, the oppression is more or less strong. The Kurds are one of the most oppressed group in Iran because the Kurdish question is, according to the Iranian authorities, a danger uh, to the country. These oppressive policies uh, weigh very heavily on the Kurds and have historically And the uh, death of Jinnah Hamini is one such example. There are still no clear statistics on the number of Kurds killed since the 1980s, but we know that thousands died in the bombardments uh, and in prison. At least 90 Kurdish women were executed over this period in the various prisons of the country. Then there's Javier Rahman, a United Nations reporter, uh, states that almost half of the political prisoners in the country are Kurds. According to the Kurdistan Human Rights Network, uh, uh, of 82 uh, people uh, executed by the uh, Islamic regime, four were executed for political reasons. President Admini Assisi uh, was uh, executed because of he belonged to the democratic uh, movement in the uh, country. The Kurds have played a very important role in the recent events, and they've paid a very heavy, heavy price for their uh, involvement. Uh, hundred, over 100 were killed, including 11 children, and also, there have also been many arrests. The Iranian regime uh, has uh, blocked Internet access in order to... Uh, fight against the demonstrators. And as the figures uh, show, the oppression levels of oppression are higher, very high, in the Kurdish reasons, but this hasn't um, cost the regime very dearly because the focus of the various organizations, both Iranian and international, was mainly on the central regions of the country rather than on the border regions of the country. And the uh, propaganda of Tehran accusing the Kurds of being separatists works very well, even uh, with part of the opposition movement. So the Kurds are often marginalized on the pretext that they are separatists. Ladies and gentlemen, members of the European Parliament, human rights in the Kurdish areas are reaching a critical point, and these regions uh, require particular attention as a result. We need to take into account the diversity of Iranian society and to adopt effective measures against the uh, regime and their violations of human rights. Do not sacrifice uh, human rights issues when negotiating with this oppressive regime, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Fatemi. Our last guest who is going to address us is Adeshia Amir Aryoman, the senior advisor to presidential candidate Mr. Mir Hossein Musabi. You have the floor for seven minutes. Uh, bonjour. Uh, je vous... 
Good morning. Thank you for your invitation. I'm here as a lawyer. I'm a law professor, and for 20 uh, years I was part of the Sheriff of Scotland, and I'm here as a lawyer today. I will share some of my views with you. In legal terms, we have a massive and systematic violation of human rights in Iran. This is not only about civil and political rights, but also economic, social and cultural rights, and environmental uh, law is also being violated. There are many different causes behind this, but the main cause is the absence of a state, uh, state of law and corruption, which is a structural aspect uh, of the uh, government, which uh, plays into the hands and w of criminal organizations in, and involving them in the legal uh, government of the country. And we are against legal sanctions which reinforce the hegemony of these uh, criminals and weakens uh, the population and civil society. To remediate the lack of the rule of law, at least uh, formally, we have for a long time called for the application of the Constitution as it stands, in spite of the weaknesses that exist in the text. The Iranian society is in a state of transition at the moment, and it is a very diverse society, and there are very different ways and sometimes contradictory ways of life. The incompetence and the structural corruption and the massive repression of the uh, protests, protesters uh, have cost the current regime all of its legitimacy and its capacity for reform. In order to save Iran, we need to avoid violence. We uh, need to foster democratic and peaceful solutions. And none of that can come from outside. It has to come from within the country. And as a result of that, we, from on the basis of this, uh, we propose uh, the idea of a referendum uh, being held on the uh, fate of the current regime. If the people vote for regime change, we would then need to put together a constituent assembly to uh, draft a new constitution. And then there would be another referendum to vote on the draft constitution. And all of this should be done uh, in keeping with the rules of equitable free and fair elections. The current laws of the Islamic Republic uh, cannot be uh, part of this process because they don't uh, ensure the rights of the various groups of Iranian society that make the society up. And we also need to take into account the fact that in order to help the Iranian people, what we need and what we're calling for is not that people meddle in the affairs of Iran, but that the Iranian people be supported. That involves moral support of the protests and demonstrations, uh, support for people who are in prison, and civil disobedience, which is massive in Iran. That also needs to be supported. It's a very complicated situation. And the international everything the, that the international community does should take into account various elements and not give the Iranian regime the opportunity to reinforce its uh, repressive activities. So what we are calling for should not feed into the aims or play into the hands of the regime. So I repeat, what is very important is
We need to help Iran find its own way from within. Thank you for your attention. Merci bien, Adeshir, uh, and thanks to all uh, our guests here who have spoken to us, who have addressed us. They very well highlighted also very different areas of defense of Iranian people and different areas of necessary change, thanks to, to each and, and every contribution. Please allow me now to give uh, the floor to Hannah Neumann, who has uh, not only contributed but also permanently asked for this week of solidarity. You are the first speaker and then we will follow our list. Hannah, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and well, thank you everyone who made this possible, but also who is here today to keep on going the discussion about Iran and the revolution that is happening there. We could see, I think, from all the speakers that everyone has suffered great losses because of the regime that is in place in Iran and what it does to its people. Most of you are not able to go back to the country, by the way, nor am I. Um, most of you are facing personal attacks. Um, and some of you, or I assume most of you, have lost friends and family members. The revolution that is happening since three months has clearly profoundly shaken Iran, but it has, I think, also shaken the world because it has shed light on the atrocities of the regime and of its resistance on, on the people in Iran. It has also showed the big solidarity that is in the side the country where women, minorities went to the streets, but then supported by people from all walks of life and all gender. And what this revolution has clearly achieved is that everyone now knows how brutal this regime is, how it is beating, raping, executing its own people only to protect its power and its kleptocratic way of life. And the only response the regime has apparently, contradictory to some announcements that we heard here, is simply more repression. And I think that, that is why it is quite clear that the regime is impossible to reform and that it is a big threat to its own people, to the region and to the world as a whole. And the question many here in the European Union we are asking ourselves right now is, what is the alternative and how can we get there? And this is also how I understand some of your remarks. And on the one side, it's clear that we as the European Union, we have to do our homework. There are a number of items outstanding. The Parliament clearly demands for listing IRGC on the terror list. It hasn't happened yet. Maybe EAS, um, who is here as well, can clarify a bit on that. We said we can't negotiate a nuclear deal with the regime while it kills its own people. So this is also clear demand from this Parliament. And we have to better protect those who are opposing the regime with visa, but also those who are in the diaspora from transnational threats. They are attacked here. We know of many. Some of you can't roam around freely in your own cities anymore, and I think this is unacceptable. And the issue of technology has been raised, especially with the Internet. But there are a number of additional aspects in the discussion, and I would be interested to hear your remarks on this one, because, yes, there seems to be some kind of an understanding. We want a referendum in Iran so that the people of Iran can decide freely where they want to go, assuming and hoping that that would be moving towards, let's say, a secular democracy. But how can we get the regime to the referendum? That is the key question, I think. And we have discussions about sending remittances back home in a strike fund. So I would like to understand how your position is on this one and how the EU can support this being possible. How is the gap breached between discussions in the diaspora and those inside the country? And maybe the last question, how can we reach a more respectful way to have these debates amongst each other? Because... At least how I observe it, the attacks are rising in, in, in magnitude, but also in, in language. And I don't think this is helping in any way if those who are against the regime are attacking each other sometimes more fiercely and in a worse way than they are attacking the regime. And that is um, something I perceive and I find this very much not helpful. So thank you all for, for coming here, for bringing your different perspectives. And I'm also happy to see so many um, colleagues here joining us for the discussion. Thank you, Hannah. Let me read out the list of speakers, which we already have. 
and then I would invite the colleagues who are not on the list to give us a, a, a hand to give us a signal that we can take note. I have, uh, and that will be the order of speakers as well, Isabel Wieseler, Thais Reuten, one of our AFED members, Bernard Getta, Andreas Schieder, Ernest Urtesun, who is also our AFED standing rapporteur on Iran. This is the list of speakers so far. If you are not on the list, please indicate. So uh, now we see three more uh, uh, colleagues. Nacho, you as well? The three colleagues in front have signaled to us, uh, and uh, I appreciate uh, that uh, uh, my home base, uh, the group of socialists and democrats, is taking a, a huge interest in our debate, and you will be on the list, of course. Isabel Wiesela. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Thank you very much, Chair. First of all, I'd like to thank all of those who have spoken before me. We cannot talk at the moment about Iran without expressing our emotion. I won't uh, elaborate on that any further, but I'd just like to say that we fully support the revolution uh, in Iran and those in uh, prison and who are suffering in other ways. Uh, words fail me, but what you're going through at the moment really is terribly. That's the first point. I will be brief because I want to spend more time listening to you than speaking. We are faced with this uh, dilemma, uh, uh, as has been uh, said. I remember the first uh, intervention, intervention of Astana when she said that I am afraid of uh, leaping into battle uh, and having the battle finishing as it did last time with dead people, people in jail and without any changes. And uh, those words still resonate uh, within me. Uh, and we're organizing our efforts now and doing everything we can and we'll continue to do that and to stand side by side with you. But I, under, I have trouble working out what will be the most efficient in effective in Iran uh, cutting relations, as you have in part asked, so sending diplomats back to home, uh, severing diplomatic ties and so forth with Iran on the one hand, and on the other hand, trying to ex exert pressure through a dialogue without, having, without being seen as weak, without being denigrated by Iran, but doing what we can uh, as far as in fostering dialogue. So I would like to hear from you all uh, say how we deal with this dilemma. I've heard you speak. Some of you uh, run more with one option, others more with the other. But if you could um, talk about this dilemma and tell us about the specific effects that each course of action can have. And that's what it's all about, helping the people there on the ground. Thank you very much. Merci, Isabel Teichreuten. Yeah, thank, thank you, Chair, and thanks to all our guests uh, for your inspiration, um, which is uh, the same inspiration that we get from the brave Iranian uh, people um, uh, continuing their uprising. And as I said many times before, they will not give up. I'm convinced that they will not give up, but we also must not give up, right? And it's, it's actually begins, begins to become uh, irritating, the silence from the member states and from the council after our numerous calls to list the IRGC for what they are, a terrorist regime. Uh, and um, uh, we filed the first amendment in the Common Foreign Security Policy in January uh, uh, to, to list them, and we had several calls after that. So um, I, I, there's not a question to you because that's our job, but um, it, uh, it is the same, uh, the same challenge. Um, I was invited by an Iranian friend in the Netherlands to a festival in front of Azadi Tower, where we will dance without risking to be arrested, where we will celebrate uh, freedom 
and that will happen. I'm convinced that they will come. But the question is, how do we get there? How can we overcome, and that's a question to you, how can we overcome this next phase, as I call it? Because now people are, uh, especially here, not in Iran, but especially here, losing the faith a little bit. So how can we come to that next phase? How can we combat the division? Because division is the greatest gift to any autocrat. And um, I want to ask you, um, hey, you also said, Ms. Goro, uh, that we need to uh, focus on the Iranians, the Iranians in Iran. So how can we get rid of that debate that is starting now outside Iran, among Iranian diaspora, among their supporters that are trying to take sides? That is the worst thing, I think, that can, uh, can, can happen to us, that we become divided, that we start to focus on discussions in New York, in, in, in Amsterdam, in, in Paris, instead of focusing on Iran. And my second question, I, I think, to, to anyone who, who wants to answer it, how can we help you individually in that struggle, in that uh, uh, struggle to keep our eyes on the ball, and, uh, and how can we contribute to that unity as a parliament, as a family of, of European parliaments, who are also convinced that we need to do more. The, 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 uh, it's more at the level of the member states and the commission that is now stuck. Um, but um, I would be grateful for your answers and uh, thanking you again for your inspiration. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thijs and Bernard Greta is our uh, next speaker, first vice president of our subcommittee. Bernard, you have the floor. Merci, President. Thank you, Chair. I would like to ask Mrs. A Mr. Argument on what basis, on the basis of what political analysis of the situation in Iran, Mr. Massavi decided publicly to break with the regime. On what basis? So that's my first question. My second question is, is the division that we have seen mounting over the past 15 years within the Iranian clergy, to what extent has that increased following the uh, demonstrations and the upheavals that we've seen of recent times? Thank you. Merci, Bernard. Now we have Andreas Schieder. Yep. Thank you, Herr Vorsitzender. Thank you, Chair. First of all, I'd like to thank the four uh, speakers and express our solidarity and our admiration for those who are working tirelessly within Iran and outside Iran. I was in Tehran at Alamgur and the Dalavant, the two highest mountains in Iraq, uh, and I was uh, there. I was in Vienna uh, when there were demonstrations uh, in front of the UN building in Vienna, and the total surveillance that we have in Iran. Uh, breathes uh, fear. In Iranian, into the hearts of Iranians who are living in Europe. They are afraid of persecution in spite of the fact that they live in the European Union. Secondly, I also thankful uh, that the situation of the Kurds was mentioned here. The fascinating thing here is that this affects all sectors of society, all uh, cultural groups, all ages, the people as a whole are suffering as a result of all of this. Two further points now. We need to repeat our uh, call for the Revolutionary Guard to go onto the terrorist list. That's the first thing. And the second thing is my question to all people who have joined us here today. What else can we do? Where can we increase our sanctions? How can we support you further in these uh, important times? Ernest Ottersund is our next speaker. 
Yes, thank you so much. Welcome to the European Parliament. And uh, let me first start by expressing my full solidarity with all your uh, political struggles and also with your personal situations, taking into account that you are uh, on the uh, prosecution by, uh, by a regime that denies uh, fundamental freedoms. So let me start by, by expressing my, my full solidarity to all of you and thank you again for being with, with us. I have three questions uh, very briefly. The first one, I think it would be good if you could elaborate a bit more on how do you see the, the evolution of the process, protests inside the country. It seems that, uh, that uh, the regime wants to show uh, to the outside world that the situation is calmed down, but we also have reports and we see more and more women uh, uh, doing actions against the hijab, so I would like um, to know your views on how do you think this will evolve uh, in, the next, uh, in the next month, taking also into account that we are entering the, the, um, uh, the, the summer, and that can have, of course, consequences on all that. Secondly, um, also Hannah Neumann made the question, which I think is very relevant for us as well, is how to make uh, or how to help uh, the work of the diaspora and the people on the ground uh, be more united or work better uh, or, or stronger. I have the impression that, that there are strong debates a bit, uh, around that, and I think it would be good also to, to see your views on also the role that DEP can play on that. I mean, this, this week of solidarity is, uh, goes, uh, of course, into that direction, but I think it would be good to know your reflections on that. And thirdly, again, to go back to the most difficult point, of course, which is how to settle the EU position towards the regime today. Because on the one hand, uh, if we want to have leverage and an influence in order to stop executions and stop repression, we need to keep some level of uh, channels open with the regime. On the other hand, we know that... Uh, that um, we cannot, as far as, for instance, uh, uh, going uh, to resume uh, and close a nuclear deal at the moment with the situation at the moment, but where, where does the balance lie? I think it would be important also to hear your opinions. And then in that debate, I think one cannot ignore the recent developments with, uh, with China and Saudi Arabia. So how these new regional dynamics uh, uh, do you think uh, should influence the position of the EU in relation to, to Iran? Because this cannot be ignored, of course. So voila, those are my three questions, and thank you again for being with us. Thank you, Ernest. Next speaker, Raphael Klugsmann. Merci, Chair. Et merci surtout. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you very much to our guests for their courageous message that they're bringing to our parliament. My first question is not for our guests, it's for the EEAS uh, and uh, the whole of the Council. How come? Uh, the uh, Islamic Revolutionary Court, Guard Corps has still not found its way onto the list of terrorist organizations. How is it not recognized as, as a terrorist organization? Not only do they wield terror on the Iranian people, but they commit terrorist acts. So how, uh, you know, even on, on our European soil, why has this not happened? How has this not happened? What is stopping the IRGC being classified as a terrorist organization. Secondly, a question to you all. Looking at uh, all of the political prisoners uh, currently uh, by the regime, what uh, measures are we adopting? Are these public campaigns working? Uh, does it put families in danger? And does it, uh, or rather, does it allow to shine a light onto this and get them freed? What can we do specifically to help people who are currently languishing in the jails of the Iranian regime. Thirdly, to Mr. Ismailian, you have mentioned uh, strikes and uh, possible solidarity funds. Could you perhaps fill us in more on that? Uh, what uh, uh, relations uh, do the trade unions from Iran have with the U ETUC, European Trade Union Congress, and? Uh, if uh, we set up uh, uh, solidarity funds, how can we be sure that the money actually does make its way to the people who really are uh, fighting the good fight on the ground? Uh, if we look at uh, industries, uh, 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 the uh, fact that uh, the, uh, the trade unions are, are, are calling these strikes, is that perhaps a way to really bring down the economy? Thank you, Rafael. Hi, Sandra Moretti. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Dana, for uh, 
uh, Hannah, rather, for uh, promoting this and uh, all the speakers uh, and rapporteurs who really have spoken and uh, are a source of inspiration to us all. Today is the 25th of April. I am Italian. In Italy, today we celebrate uh, the liberation of our country from the German Nazis. Today in Italy, we remember all the activists, uh, the partisans of the resistance, the uh, partisans uh, who, in a certain way, rebelled against the regime and uh, uh, left uh, their families, left the university, embraced uh, weapons to combat uh, the uh, invaders. And thanks to the resistance, today we have uh, uh, one of the most beautiful uh, Italian uh, uh, constitutions. So I'd like to thank you all for being here, because I really hope that uh, your courage and the resistance that you have uh, been showing over the last few months in Iran really can be the source of uh, a g huge liberal revolution to liberate this marvellous country of yours, to have freedom, dignity, and bring those to all. Over these months, uh, we, among all of our colleagues, have been trying to give you support to do whatever we can so that uh, your voices can be heard and not be isolated to to really amplify that in this chamber, which is a symbol of freedom and justice. Uh, I take on board all of the requests that uh, the colleagues uh, have uh, made to you. How can we help you even more, particularly also I am very concerned for all the detainees, for the conditions of people in jails, and uh, of course how they are being treated, how the people who who uh, survive uh, this torture. We have uh, uh, taken uh, on board uh, the uh, sponsorship uh, of uh, these detain detainees. Is this useful? We want to continue to uh, get more and more MEPs uh, on board for this uh, kind of political adoption, if you like, uh, uh, of these uh, prisoners, uh, putting a stop to contracts and commercial agreements uh, with uh, the regime to, uh, to uh, isolate uh, Iran. Is that effective? Is that efficient? Or, as has been said, is that in fact just punishing the people of Iran? Is that negative? I am extremely, uh, I find it very indignant that the IRGC has not been included on the list of terrorist organizations worldwide. And uh, visas for activists, uh, is this something that can be a useful tool? And if so, how do you think uh, um, Europe is uh, really performing on this level? Thank you very much. Uh, Alessandra, and our next speaker is Dietmar Köster. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you for having you uh, with us. And uh, it is really great to have the opportunity to share your views. And um, your statement um, shows clearly that the European Union must support the revolutionary forces, that Iran will find its own way for its democratic society. I would like to raise the following question. Last week, the very controversial Reza Pahlavi paid a historic visit to Israel. Apparently, the Iranian opposition has different views on this. Some say it reinforces their position that Israel is not an enemy, while others say it does not help the protest movement. Second question is, for months, the cases of poisoning in schools have caused great horror. Apparently, not a day goes by without attacks. That's why Amnesty International has called for an independent and comprehensive investigation. What else do you think needs to happen? My last question is, we can see that girls and women in Iran um, are on the streets without their hearts, uh, head, head, headscarves. And um, the regime is reacting with more repression on this development. Last week, the government declared that it would take drastic action against anyone who disregards the headscarf law. It immediately followed up its words with action. 
They closed a lot of uh, companies. They closed a lot of restaurants. At the university, students protested against these measures. And this shows clearly the regime is not willing to make any concession this time. Its excess, excess, existential survival is at stake, which is why it places a fight against dissident women above all other burning issues. How do you assess this? Thank you, schön. Dietmar, did I miss anybody who would like to speak from our colleagues here in the room? This is not the case. Then I will now give the opportunity for our guests, for our distinguished panelists uh, to answer. Uh, dear friends, you have seen the huge commitment of our colleagues to be supportive. There have been very general questions on the development uh, in Iran, but also very specific questions directed to, to uh, you uh, and to your inputs. I would do that um, in the reverse order and first give the floor to Adeshi Amir Ayoman to address us. Please, you have the floor. Thank you very much for your questions. Uh, well, what's, uh, how can we change uh, people's lives? Or what to change my life? Well, it's, it's not something that uh, happened uh, suddenly. They've had a very position, a firm position from 2017 and 2019 that was reconfirmed with the repression uh, uh, the re and the show, uh, you know, the repression has uh, really very much uh, increased uh, as there has been a request for self-determination. So the, the main lines really that are important uh, in the development of the situation in Iran, uh, they, they affect his position. If you look at the uh, breadth of the uh, protests against the regime, uh, you can see there's a correlation with the breadth of the repression. The situation shows that people have uh, already sort of outgrown the uh, uh, current uh, regime and that the regime no longer respects any rules of democracy. You can see that in their response. So there's no legitimacy anymore for this regime. Uh, uh, added to that uh, is the social injustice, economic issues, the great uh, crisis uh, uh, across the country, uh, which it is currently facing. And it uh, underscores uh, the most important uh, crisis, uh, which is the paradox, uh, the insolvable uh, paradox of the regime. There's, a, there's an internal paradox in the regime. In the Faria, as I see, uh, you've got a dictatorial regime, which is a personal and irresponsible personal regime, which cannot respond to the demands and requirements of the Iranian people. He says you just have to keep just pushing forward. He said, well, we've been calling for the... Uh, in, in the overall the total application of the Constitution for many years and uh, to uh, have a, a, a sort of uh, a, a transfer uh, or a movement to a, a, a different society, you have to overcome uh, a number of these uh, issues. But this is, it has to be based on the rule of law. So this is uh, what I would say that needs to happen for the future of Iran. I think there were already differences uh, inside the uh, IRGC. These differences have grown considerably uh, over the last uh, few years uh, because uh, a lot of Iranians are no longer uh, uh, satisfied or, or no longer agree with the way that the country is being run, but they don't have the resources, they don't have the means to overthrow the regime. Khomeini in the last uh, 30 years has tried uh, to change the very basis 
of uh, uh, society, the uh, clerical basis society. Having the clergy depend upon the regime, and that's a very in important in our analysis of the current situation, he's created this dependence on him by the clergy because they know that the respect uh, of uh, Islam and, uh, and the Shia movement is central uh, to uh, his uh, uh, um, power, but of course uh, that runs counter to the very fundamental principles of uh, the Shiite uh, movement. Uh, have, uh, should I address the other questions made or should I stop here? Okay, I'll carry on. Other questions you've asked. The question about uh, the situation of women in Iran. I think uh, where civil society really has uh, uh, really been successful is the uh, civil disobedience. Um, it's the first time, in fact, that the regime has actually been publicly um, beaten. It's uh, lost its legitimacy. It's uh, shown its incompetence in uh, running the country. If the regime uh, falls, what uh, we're seeing is that uh, women have pushed forward this, uh, uh, to a certain extent, successful uh, unveiling of uh, the regime. But it's a very complicated situation because even within the repressive uh, forces and the police force, they're not uh, prepared to follow uh, the orders of their superiors. They've got uh, daughters, they've got wives who are behaving like these protesters and um, are making declarations and conversations they've had with Khomeini. They have spoken to Khomeini. We have the same issue happening inside our houses. So uh, they really can't do anything to, to stop the women. So the declaration, they've really insisted upon this fact that the important thing is, uh, you know, to uh, the, the future of the Republic depends on the, on the women fighting for this. It's a very specific uh, question of Bana. Are you satisfied with that or would you come back, Bana? Just. Just let me clarify one thing. When you say that women have won the battle, are you alluding to the fact that now we see women uh, walking without a headscarf in the streets of Tehran, or are you referring to something else? No, I'm actually referring to something else. They have partially won this combat because, uh, you know, fortunately they can now walk in the streets without uh, a headscarf, but also the uh, the, uh, the Iranian repression w w will not prevail. They've partially won because this is unstoppable now. Because uh, it shows that the regime has already lost the battle. Uh, despite all of the restrictions they've uh, imposed, they will not uh, win the day. And uh, the mechanisms that they've tried to create to uh, sort of uh, uh, bring uh, women once again under their heel and to stop the resistance is not working. And uh, this is also visible within the internal uh, play of forces within the regime. Me to answer the questions. Well, just about the issue of uh, women. For me, it's also a victory, and I'll tell you why, because uh, it's uh, not uh, just uh, being able to walk uh, bareheaded in the street, it's everything. It's the question of the uh, veil of the headscarf. That's part of the ideology of the regime up to now. We've had a lot of movements, a lot of demonstrations, but each time we said it's the fault of this or that government. But now, because we were never bold enough to say that the target is uh, Khamenei, is the, in, uh, the, the Islamic Republic. But now, thanks to this question of headscarves, thanks to this question of women, it's the, it, we can see the end uh, of uh, the uh, Islamic Republic, for, perhaps for the time being. The movement uh, 
uh, has been oppressed and is being oppressed, but the important thing is the change of mentality in Iranian. We've changed everything. We've said, okay, up to now, we've put a lot of resources into trying to reform the regime, but that's it. Now, with this whole headscarf uh, issue, say, we are demanding the end of the Islamic Republic. We uh, uh, want to have uh, politicians that set up true gender parity and uh, gender equality throughout uh, the, the Green uh, Movement and the other demonstrations. Uh, the question, the women's issue was always marginalized, but now, for the first time, they've accepted that this issue is fundamental. It's front and center of the whole movement. Uh, many women have taken uh, part in these demonstrations. And they had other claims and other demands, uh, 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 Kurdish women, Baluch uh, women, and uh, class questions, uh, national issues, minorities, ethnic minorities, and so on. Because uh, oppression is not quite the same. But uh, what has been important and what we've seen here now is that they've really attacked the very foundations of the regime for the first time, the Islamic Republic. Uh, uh, you know, they've put down the demonstrations, but now they are uh, focusing uh, and targeting girls at school, saying, well, up to now you've made a lot of progress, but now I'm going to pull you out of school so that you can't uh, learn, just like the Taliban are doing in Afghanistan. And for me, this time we see that uh, the regime, that they are afraid of the movement and there's no going back. There's a lot of changes happening in Iranian society. And we said, OK, we've got this and that and that demand. We've marginalized so many things like women and ethnic minorities. But now for us, that's it. Uh, our demands are something we're insisting on. We're insisting on women's rights and we need and we absolutely have to achieve our rights. And it's a victory because it's changed the dynamics in society and the government know they cannot continue in this vein. Merci, Fatime. Thank you, Fatime. How many is million? Respond to questions. Thank you very much. There were a number of questions, so I, I tried to answer a few of them. So uh, uh, the point is that the main question was how we can help. I mean, the most... Uh, efficient way is to empower Iranian people inside the country. And there are ways to do that. I can, I can focus on three things. Uh, one is internet, as we said several times. The access to internet is blocked in, several, in various places in the country. Two main issues in internet, one is Starlink and the other one is VPN. So uh, people need VPN to have an access to, to the social media. Uh, applications and uh, also a Starlink for the activist, for, uh, for 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 ordinary people. I don't mean that this doesn't happen. There are lots of Iranians, the young generation out of the country, that they're already started that. And uh, I'm in touch with uh, a lot of people, like uh, as I said, the young activists around the world, that we are focusing on this and we are tr we are trying to organize and. Um, have a way to send a Starlink inside the country and also VPNs. The other thing is helping the families of detainees and uh, families of the, um, uh, I mean, uh, all the individuals that we lost in the last six months or in the last 40 years. So uh, one important thing is that you probably see that some detainees got released on bail or uh, other situations, but there are more than 100 prominent activists that they never let them go. Like I heard Nasrin Sotuda's name, for example. So she's out on medical conditions, but they wanted to take her husband inside, in the, inside the prison. So, and other activists, I know that uh, another activist like had, ha, has a trial this week. So the prominent ones, they never get released. So they are the ones that they can plan for, for the next steps. And when we talk about negotiation or when we talk about these uh, uh, political channels that I try to address that too, I mean, it's very important to ask the, the regime, 
to uh, like uh, release this 100, 150 prominent activists, then you will see the change. Then you will see the change. And the third one is about the strikes. Um, I know that some, some Iranians out of the country, they already started to work on the uh, strike funds, but it's very difficult. There are very uh, important issues here. The first one is that we need an exemption. I think uh, it's very difficult to send money to Iran. It's impossible, actually, in, in large am amounts. And uh, for Starlink, we got the exemption. So that's why their stalling goes inside the country. But for strike funds, not yet. So we need the exemption from different countries first. And we need to add, you know, appoint some NGOs that they can send the funds. I'm not worried about the networks inside the country. They are networks inside the country that they can work together and find the right people to, to distribute the money. The most important part and the most difficult one is out of the country, the exemptions and the way that we can send money legally to the country. They are underground ways, but to, to send legal money there, it's a little difficult. We are working on that too. For example, I, I am in um, communication with Canadian government to, appoint, to find one, two NGOs that we can raise money, send it to Iran, not only for strikes, for, for internet, for VPNs and uh, uh, also, and about the, the the negotiation with Iran and the embassies, you know, uh, 44 years of crimes, 44 years, and we have seen that the embassies have been open for a long time. When I'm saying that the ambassadors should be called back, because I haven't seen any outcome of the negotiation. So in 1980s, they executed thousands of people, but the, the embassies were open. In 1990s, they oppressed the student movement and the, the embassies were open. But the time that you called the ambassadors after Mykonos uh, terrorism attack in Berlin, you saw that the uh, reform happened in Iran. Months later. So the, the only language they understand is the political pressure. So if you don't send them the, the very strong political message, they don't get it. They don't understand it. And Okay, and after that, the embassies were open again. In 2009, they oppressed the Green Movement. And then the bloody November. And then they sh sh shoot down the, uh, the airplane. And after that, now you see that in the last seven months, they hang people in sham trials, and the embassies are open. Do you see any changes? And most of these victims are children. Most of them. In bloody November, they killed more than 50 children. Uh, in, 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 in flight PS752, they murdered 29 children. And in, in the last six months, more than 70 of the victims are children. And the embassies are open and we don't see any changes. So that's why we, we ask for, for some uh, a strong message to the Islamic Republic of Iran. And about the visas that you ask, yes, we need visas for some victims. We have a boy in Turkey right now. He's 18-year-old, Zani Arton Ro. He lost his one eye, and he's losing another eye. Family of six. The community out of Iran, like in Canada, we, we sponsor them. We say, okay, if they come to Canada or other countries, we sponsor them, we take them to the hospitals. But this visa issue is like an obstacle for us. And this boy is suffering. He was in camp for, for days, for weeks, and now he's out of the camp, and some Iranians there, they're taking care of them. But... Germany gives visa to two of the family members. It's a family of six. So this mom and dad, they have four children. One lost eye, the other two are 13, and the, the fourth one is seven-year-old. What do you want them to do? Just leave two of them or three of them there in, in Turkey and go move to Germany? No, that's, that's not fair. So we need to see these issues and look at the human rights in the right way. So visas, yes, and this is Zonyar is just an example of dozens of people in Turkey that they're suffering, and they're just examples of, of the suffering of the Iranian people. Thank you very much. Mr. Ahmed uh, Ismail, many thanks for this very concrete contribution. Before I give the floor to Madi Golro, let me also invite you, as well as our other guests, 
not to leave without giving us that very concrete information where we can be supportive also in respect of activities in our member states. I think uh, my members here in this uh, subcommittee have all shown with their contributions that they are standing ready to support you also in individual cases whenever they can do so. So please give us more concrete uh, <clears throat> uh, information and, and perhaps we can, via your support, also become active here in these cases you mentioned. Madi Golro. I appreciate your attention to the details in my country and uh, I try to answer to all questions but in one or two sentences. Uh, Islamic regime tried to pass some uh, rules against women and the strategy was that when we pass the rules against women, men support us. When we pass the rules against Kurdish people or Turkish people, Farce people support us. Or if the official religion be Islam and Shia, uh, the Shia people support us. But now, especially during uh, five or six, or I can say in the, late, uh, the decades, uh, people support each other without uh, attention to the gender, to the religion, to the ethnicity. And it's very, very important because it's uh, break down the strategy of uh, regime for make an enemy from people against each other. So that's why the, it, this, this revolution and this movement is completely different with the uh, past movement, previous movement. Another thing is about um, a dialogue. Uh, yes, dialogue is good, but uh, when a woman from Western country who believe to the uh, other religion and don't believe to the Islam, go to Iran and in front of the mullah wear hijab, it's not negotiation. It's not dialogue. It's uh, really um, when uh, we as a women see this uh, kind of photo or movie, just we think how they can't understand we as a women under dictatorship, under Islamic regime. Just I, as a woman, begging, please, all the women who doesn't believe to the Islam, don't wear hijab in front of the mullah in Iran. It's not negotiation. Really bother us. And but you say we want to make a negotiation? I can't understand it. And another thing about uh, um, how can help to Iranian in diaspora? Ignore the propaganda regimes. Don't talk with the propaganda regime. The journalists, who, who are not just Iranian journalists. The Islamic propaganda support with the oil money and can change the truth. If you want to believe the propaganda, you think all the people in Iran live in peace and all of them love Mullah. According to the propaganda, it's the fact. And all the time in the, uh, Islamic television, uh, TV, uh, everybody say all over the world, all over the world, in the rest of the world is war, and all the men rape the women, and all the country are uh, live in the poverty, and the best place is Iran, and that's why we need the freedom uh, and internet, and that's why you shouldn't talk about the freedom just. Uh, with, uh, without pay attention to the human rights in Iran. And uh, another thing is about the connection between Iran, Islamic regime, and Saudi Arabia and China. I think, I believe, the modern revolution, women life freedom, is a danger, big danger for all the extremist regime in the uh, Middle East. Of course, Saudi Arabia should support the Iran because if women can 
break all the Islamic rules, other women in other countries, Middle East, Iraq, Egypt, Syria, uh, and Saudi Arabia, believe, okay, we can be equal. And it can make a feminist revolution in the Middle East. So I, I think the Saudi Arabia uh, have to support the Islamic regime, not the secular government in Iran. And about Russia and China, uh, when uh, the government in Iran can support by money and buy uh, product from China, so it's good for Chinese government. And uh, when the Islamic regime doesn't have any connection and relationship with the Western country, it's, uh, it's the best situation for Chinese and uh, for Russia. So I, I think it's um, until that day that the Iranian regime doesn't have connection with the Western country, uh, Russia and China be become a good friend for the regime. And uh, about the future in Iran, uh, I think when the human rights activists uh, all over the world uh, think about the Franco, Hitler, Mussolini, or others, doesn't think they want to back to the monarchy people in this kind of country, want to back to the monarchy or want uh, the um, republic government. Uh, so it's the same for Iran. After going out to Khamenei and uh, after uh, revolution in Iran, people in the independent and freedom referendum can uh, say what they want. So before that, you as a Western country out of Iran just should support the people for that days. After that, People in Iran can uh, make a decision what they want. They want democracy, but the constitutional uh, monarchy or the uh, secular uh, republican. And so the, after that, it's um, just the people in Iran business. And uh, last thing about the student activists. Uh, Islamic regime preferred to close the university, especially during last months. But uh, the students, activists make a protest, make demonstration in the university. They was arrested, and uh, but they still make a demonstration and sitting in the university. So it's uh, it's very important we attention to the human rights and education rights as a part of human rights, women rights as a part part of uh, human rights, and uh, yes, I think that's enough. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Madi Goro. Thanks very much, all our guests. Uh, we have the pleasure to have with us Florent Nita, Deputy Head of Division uh, Iran of the European External Action Service. Uh, for comments and uh, remarks, we have seen how important European institutions are for defining our relationship in this situation with the people of Iran. That means member states, that means the high rep, that means uh, our European Ex External Action Service, could you please come in for your comments? Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Bullman and uh, Frau Ernst, uh, honorable members of, uh, of the Parliament and dear speak guests in the speaking capacity. And really thank you for facilitating the exchange today. It just builds on the intensive political attention that you had over the last months uh, on Iran, uh, on including the, the serious human rights uh, violation. Um, I think it's, it's not uh, uh, new to say that after the dreadful killing of uh, Mas Amini uh, and the issuing protest, uh, we had a very swift and very uh, forceful reaction as a EU. Um, we not only reacted publicly with uh, clear messages in support of the Iranian people, uh, we, um, we passed uh, statements, declaration of the High Representative on behalf of EU27 member states, 
we had interventions, uh, including in the Parliament uh, here or uh, the High Representative in the, in the wider plenary of the Parliament. And I think uh, there was no occasion that High Rep uh, didn't use to really pass very, very, very strong messages to his counterpart in Iran uh, uh, on, on everything that happened over the last months. Uh, and, uh, and I think uh, the Iranian authorities know very, very clearly where we stand. And we cleared the ground, I would say, very firmly. Um, in his capacity as chairman of the Foreign Affairs Council, over the last six months, the Foreign Affairs Council had Iran on its agenda constantly, either on the current affairs or a discussion point. And um, um, it was uh, under the chairman of the High Representative that uh, we adopted not least than seven packages of sanctions on, on serious human rights violation in Iran. And the last one was even yesterday at FAC in Luxembourg. And we now have more or less uh, 238 entries on the Iran human rights regime. Uh, and this is now more than double the number compared to before uh, the protest started. Um, some of you mentioned the issue of listing uh, IRGC as a terrorist organization. And I think you know very well uh, uh, how Neumann and, uh, and, uh, and the other MAPs that raised the issue that this issue is in the hands of the member states. You need unanimous decision by member states and you need to have clear uh, legal hurdles being passed. And uh, we have IRGC being listed as, uh, in its entirety. Uh, we have IRGC individuals uh, and entities which are being listed uh, under different, uh, different uh, sanction regime, under the EU sanction regime. But on this particular one, you know very well the discussion is between member states and based on, on these two clear uh, criteria, first, in political unanimity, and second, uh, legal um, hurdles to be, to be passed. Um, speaking about the, the member states and the council, in December we had a new set of council conclusions on Iran, and I, it was uh, compared to the, the, the conclusions that we had uh, back in January 2019, it was a very different tone, uh, and I really invite you to, to, to go through, through the latest set of conclusions. And the tone is very, very tough, uh, including on all the issues that uh, we have in relation to Iran, including on all the human rights uh, violation that we, uh, we, we, we have under our attention today. Um, at the same time, um, and I'm, I'm glad that uh, some of you mentioned uh, the question to what extent you balance the overall pressure with the need to have dialogue. And that's precisely what is the, the, the gist of the conclusions that we had, and that's precisely what member states also advocate to keep this balance between, between pressure and dialogue. Because precisely this dialogue allows us to, to really uh, address all the issues that are of serious concern to us, including the, the human rights violation, including the consular issues and the, the arbitrary detention of EU uh, citizens in Iran, um, and uh, not to, to mention uh, all the, the, the other issues. Uh, and with a weaker cooperation with Iran, which is already happening uh, in the bilateral level, comes certainly a weaker access to, to voices and people in Iran and to human rights defenders. And that's unfortunately the case, but it's a way to also uh, to, to, to pass a very clear message to, at the same time to the Iranian authorities that we cannot have just business as usual. And that's why I think it's important that you, you are here today as, uh, as many of your uh, uh, country fellows and, and share with us how you see the situation and, and how um, uh, the European Parliament or the institution overall can be of, of help. Thank you so much. Thank you for your contribution. Uh, Mr. Nita, could I come back with one precise question and with one idea? Um, First of all, you mentioned the technical hurdles of uh, putting the Revolutionary Guards on this terror list. Is there also an argument, a political argument on content which is present in the deliberations of the council members or in the uh, environment of the high rep uh, which could be discussed here? And uh, would you also accept that we uh, continue this uh, conversation which we had today 
perhaps I will discuss with the coordinators uh, during the afternoon, either in a public meeting or in a in-camera meeting, to show us the concrete list of activities of support member states as well as the European institutions are already and to hopefully tomorrow uh, uh, increasingly um, addressing to uh, the freedom fighters in Iran. That would be my question. But I see Rafael Glucksmann as well uh, interesting in uh, taking the floor, and I see Hannah Neumann interesting. We have some minutes left, so perhaps we should do that exercise very quickly. Rafael and then Hannah. Yeah, I will be very brief. Thank you, Chair. Just uh, for us to, to understand, we know perfectly well that it's not your decision and it's not the high risk decision, but for us to understand a bit more about why our common request from the Parliament is not followed up by action and is the same on Wagner, for instance, group, uh, could you tell us which countries, which member states are blocking? Because it's always the same problem with the Council, that it's dark, there is no publicity about the debates, and therefore you don't have actions taken, and nobody is assuming any cost for inaction. So could you please tell us in which way uh, and with which arguments which countries are blocking? Thank you. Anna? Thank you. My question adds a bit on that one. Uh, first, on the issue of dialogue. Um, we know that if you have dialogue with someone, it kind of means you at least recognize that they have some power and they speak for some people. So having dialogue with the regime stabilizes the regime in this position. So my question is, what is it that we got in return over the last six months? And at the same time, do you also have dialogue with other people such as the six up here, but also others that are out there to also understand what their perspective on Iran is. How is that happening in which context? Because I'm only aware about the dialogue that EAS is having with um, representatives of the regime. And the second question goes with the terror listing. And uh, Rafael mentioned one point. So which are the member states that are actually blocking? Because we in our capacities can pressure our own governments um, because there's anonymity almost inside the European Parliament um, for the listing, so which member states are blocking. And we know that on some topics, EAS is hiding behind member states. I have the impression that is the case here. On some topics, especially our high rep can be quite outspoken and can be quite provocative in pushing member states in a direction. I have not observed this when it comes to the listing, on behalf of Mr. Borrell, correct me, please, if I'm wrong and tell me where he did that. And the last question, and maybe that's more something for later in camera meeting, um, we, when we see where EU support goes, also financially inside Iran, I don't see so much support going to civil society organization. Maybe we can discuss internally how this could be improved, also with uh, some of the information that we can also get internally from UN, because I know once you talk about it, it gets uh, more complicated. And maybe, Udo, if one of the speakers also has a question to EAS, I, if the time allows, I think that would be interesting um, to make, um, give them the opportunity as well. I take this uh, uh, in the slim version, not in the extensive version. I take this uh, uh, proposal on part if there is any question from our guests to the External Action Service, I ask them now to raise their hand. This is not the case. So, Mr. Nita, please come back to the questions of our colleagues. Thank you very much for the questions. Um, just to start with the, um, the IRGC listing, um, you know very well that <laughs> I'm not in a position to share the names of my member states. The discussion in the Foreign Affairs Council are confidential, and that's the way it is. So it's, it's beyond my mandate or the mandate of EES to share the names of member states uh, uh, and how the discussion goes in the Council. This is just by the way of procedures. Uh, we are not in a position to share such information uh, uh, at all. Uh, second, in terms of dialogue uh, and what we have achieved so far, I mean, we have, uh, we have been, uh, I think, over the last month, been very clear in, in the bilateral engagement with the the Iranian authorities and pass very, very strong messages. And I think that's precisely what these channels of dialogue managed to, to do. 
is to really uh, make sure that, that they really understand where we are and our red lines and, uh, and that, that these have to be understood. Um, you mentioned, uh, Chairman Bullman, about, about uh, the extent to which uh, uh, the political consideration in our GC listing have been taken into account. And I think it's very clear for everyone, uh, sanctions, EU sanctions at all, are first and foremost a political message. There is a wider debate to what extent sanctions are effective or not, but the first and foremost is a political message. And I think it was very important and is still very important that we have these sanctions and we uh, member states have been very clear in the conclusions uh, of December that we stand ready to, uh, they stand ready to, to, uh, to, uh, to look at all the options uh, at their disposal, including uh, restrictive measures in, in approaching and addressing all the issues of concern with Iran. And I think that's a very, very strong message that the member states uh, have put uh, very loudly in the public. And uh, certainly every single decision, uh, including on, on, on sanctions, is a political decision. And uh, the legal hurdles that I mentioned, and uh, as I said, is, is something that is, is in the remit of the, of the Foreign Affairs Council and with the member states uh, and, and their confidential uh, discussion on this, uh, that's something which is, again, um, a combination between political and legal, and I think uh, it's a sovereign decision of every single member state how it positions itself on this issue. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Mr. Nita, for being with us uh, today, and many thanks for this uh, uh, dialogue and this uh, conversation. As the chairman of the Subcommittee of Human Rights, let me conclude on this element of our conversation. First of all, <laughs> Uh, we very well understand your personal situation and that you cannot go in this dialogue beyond your means. That is on an individual uh, basis totally justified and accepted. But for us, this is not, and that has nothing to do with you personal, that is not acceptable on institutional terms because neither the subcommittee nor AFED uh, co-organizer today nor the delegation for Iran nor the European Parliament uh, is willing to fall victim to the Kafka syndrome uh, sitting in front of the palace uh, and uh, do not find how to access a system which is a democratic institution under the European treaties. And we will find our way to get access, I'm pretty sure, and I think I can speak on behalf of all of my colleagues here. We will find our way to open this dialogue. We will find our way to get access to this information we are requesting, and we are finding our way to send messages. Now the floor is to Cornelia um, as the head of the Iran delegation, and uh, she will uh, find her personal resume as well, perhaps also indicate the forthcoming issues. Yeah, thanks a lot. I'd like to say the following. First of all, thank you to one and all. And the position that's being taken is not an easy position to take. And it's been taken very judiciously. Uh, colleagues, please uh, look at what the impact would be of such a terror listing. Most of these measures are already in place. Access to data, the whole issue about uh, assets, uh, that's been in place for a long time now. Then there's the question of the definition of terror and what is we need to be very clear about how that's defined, what that means. And there are clear opportunities for the regime. What would happen if the regime uh, were to challenge a terror listing and the difficulties that would pose? It's a daily battle. Uh, to find the right answers to the issues. It's not an easy task. I think it would be good to find, 
finding a North Korean solution is, may not be the way to go. We need to be very careful in our selection of a strategy. There are no simple solutions. I understand all of the criticisms that are being uh, voiced. And I don't see any clear solutions uh, here. And that is why we need to discuss what has been uh, said by the panelists. We need to talk about, for example, the issue of free access to Internet. And we should try to work with the Libe Committee, uh, see if we can organize a meeting on that and then find out how to move forward on the basis of that. We have the Chaos Computer Club in Germany, for example. These are ex they are experts in this sort of issue. I need to speak with them uh, and others. That is something we really need to do. Then there's the financial aspect. We need the commission. How do we want to do that? How, do, how can we support people in Iran? How can we support them if we don't have access to... Uh, Ability, if we have no ability to send money there. We need to talk about that problem as well. Support of the families of those in prison, uh, access to prisons, that's extremely important to the people uh, affected by that. I've heard of initiatives uh, from organizations uh, saying, what can we do to cooperate? What initiatives can we launch? So we need an exchange of views here. First and foremost, in order to support the people in Iran, because that's where the power needs to come from, the people in Iran. And so we need to support them in every way we can. We need to support workers, students. So we should maybe involve the EMPL committee, the Employment Committee. They might be able to play a useful role in all of this. I think I'll get in touch with them. But we have a lot uh, to do, a lot of uh, work before us. And I'd like to thank everybody, the, uh, leader, uh, the leadership of the um, DROI committee as well. I'd like to thank you all. Good morning, colleagues. I think I can speak uh, on all of you, on behalf of all of you. We are all in many, many meetings in this house, in many, many uh, assemblies, uh, delegations, uh, committee meetings, and sometimes we ask ourselves what the real outcome was and uh, whether it was worthwhile to attend. For this morning, I can say this was meaningful. This gathering was meaningful. Thanks again for your inputs because you made that. You gave us the chance to uh, exchange and you were a source of inspiration. You were a source of hope and you laid the ground for forthcoming support and collaboration. Many, many thanks. Uh, many ideas for this week's, for the forthcoming events and for further collaboration as Cornelia outlined. We have now a break and will continue at 2.30. Thanks a lot.